so this presentation is about uh, data discovery. Um, this presentation is about the, the process that uh, was involved in building that project and why we had uh, this project in mind, what problem we tried to solve, and how. First of all, um, where we are. My name is uh, Francois. I'm working for the SRE uh, reverse team at Criteo. I'm Mathieu. Uh, I'm part of the reverse team as well. So the reverse team were a team of uh, seven people. Um, our mission statement is we convey all the business logs of Criteo from the top level applications to uh, the computing clusters, uh, Hadoop, Kafka, uh, Kafka Streams, uh, Spark Streaming, Flink, whatever uh, can be used for the processing at Credio. And we are also responsible for data formats. Uh, that means uh, data formats on the wire between top level applications and uh, the computing clusters, but also uh, data formats on HDFS for the business logs. The landscape we are evolving in is uh, basically we work with logs. We have logs, a lot of logs, uh, 80 terabytes per day, uh, 500 uh, billion lines, log lines per day, a few events types, uh, nearly uh, 90. And we are running something like uh, 90,000 import jobs per day to ingest all this data into HDFS. Our Hadoop environment, because we are relying on Hadoop for doing the last. We have four, pro four clusters, four Hadoop clusters, uh, two production clusters, two pre-production clusters. We are, the main production clusters is running something like 250,000 uh, jobs per day. And basically, our jobs in that environment is that we manage ingesting 80 terabytes per day in this big hard drive uh, using a lot of jobs every day. The code, the at Quido we are using uh, a few different frameworks, uh, mainly scalding based on cascading, but we also have map reduced jobs a few ones. Uh, we use Hive a lot because uh, BIs are using Hive at Quido a lot. Uh, we use Spark since uh, one, two years uh, in production more and more. And we also use uh, Hadoop streaming with uh, Mono. That's true. And uh, we, are running, we have thousands of jobs and a lot of code uh, involved in, in that. So everything is cool. We have uh, data. We have a lot of data. We have a lot of code. We have a lot of interesting things to do with this data. That's cool. We are doing that since a few years now. But there are, there are some issues because uh, with time, uh, we found some issues. And we first have some symptoms. There are a few symptoms we have. For example, uh, we have hard credit path in the code. A lot of jobs have their input paths are coded or output paths are coded in the code. We sometimes have overloaded clusters. We sometimes have data that we we can't understand what, where, where this data come from or we can't understand where this data is going to. And we also have some weird formats here and there, Swift, JSON, protobuf. And we have a lot of questions. Uh, that people are asking us, can I remove this folder? Can I use this data? Where can I find that? Why this data is in this format? Uh, who's producing this uh, four terabytes of data per day? Uh, what happened? What's going on? Why the cluster is overloaded? And for all these questions, we, we just can't answer easily. So that the main reason why we are doing this presentation is to present why we were doing this framework, it's mostly because we had every day these kind of questions. 
we can find a lot of different causes for, for these questions. The first one is probably the growth, because we have more and more traffic. We have something like plus 40% uh, traffic increase every, every year, so because we have more clicks, we have more data, we have more users. But we also have new projects all the time because we have, we have new products, we build new projects, we build new jobs, we build new data sets. And for these reasons, we, we have more and more code, more and more data, more and more users, more and more developers. We also have an issue is that everything is almost ad hoc. Because a few years ago when Credeo started to do Hadoop, uh, there was no common framework, and since then, everything evolved in a pretty organic way. So there is almost no SDK that is shared between every people that, that are doing Hadoop development. And as an example, there are hundreds of different input formats, Hadoop input formats and Hadoop output formats used here. Sometimes it's for doing the same thing, sometimes it's duplicated code, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's to deal with specific uh, business case. And for this reason, it's really difficult to have shared good practices because we have no shared code. We have no framework, we have no common way to do things. And for this reason, each standardization attempt is extremely expensive in terms of human cost and synchronization between teams because we have something like maybe 200 developers doing Hadoop jobs, uh, code reviews on Hadoop code, and it's really difficult to synchronize everyone, every team involved, uh, to have a common way to monitor, to emit metrics, and these kind of things. We also have a lack of visibility. Because as we don't have any shared framework, we don't have any shared code for emitting metrics, for testing, for monitoring. So we don't have any monitoring standards because we don't, we don't have any basis to put these standards in place. And for this reason, it's also very difficult to have visibility over data flows, understand where the data is flowing around one framework. And Another consequence of that is that every try, when we try to refactor something, when we try to refactor a job, if we, for example, want to change the format of uh, computed data, we can't predict if it will break something because we don't have the graph of the data. And we can't understand what, is, what, what will be the consequence of putting this new code in production because we have thousands of jobs and we just have no visibility over what will happen because of that. We are pretty much under-optimized on a lot of things. Um, first of all, uh, the format we are using is JSON since the beginning of Hadoop at Quileo. And a few months ago, we did the uh, distributed um, uh, distributed profiling in the cluster, and we found out that something like 40% of the CPU time of the 2000s machine I was talking before is used, in fact, to deserialize and serialize JSON, which is pretty normal because this, that's a processing uh, cluster, but that's pretty expensive. And earning something like saving 10% of that 40% can have a huge impact on the cost of the cluster. Because we have no observability, we have no visibility over what happened, sometimes we are computing data multiple times. Sometimes we are emitting one field in multiple event types, for example, because people can't see where this event type is emitted already. So if they need this event type somewhere else, they have to add it in another, another log. And for this reason, we have the same data emitted twice on the wire, on Hadoop, this is processed twice. And this can cost a lot, and this is not optimal. Previously, we had we stored JSON strings in sequence files as JZIP. It's really cool because it's easy to consume. It's easy to process manually if you want to do a bash script to convert 
a sequence file into a text file that's really easy, but it's not really convenient for the kind of processing we have, especially for uh, BIs who are doing Hive queries on a few columns of one event, we have to unserialize all the records. That's one of the reasons why we decided to switch to ProBuff and Parquet. Parquet is a columnar format. ProBuff, we will talk about ProBuff a little bit later, but the most important here is Parquet. Because Parquet is a columnar format, and for many use cases we have at Creo, like accessing a few fields in, in a log, this is really more efficient because of the columnar uh, format. This can also embed the schema of the data, <coughs> and this is really convenient for what we will talk a little bit later about schemas. For all these reasons, um, we, we built a, a list of requirements we had. We need to scale rapidly because each year we have plus 40%. On our side, as an SRE team, we need to ease our everyday work because one of the things we are doing as an SRE team, as the maintainer of the data, is that we are maintaining the format, the path, the quotas, uh, the users of the, of the data on HDFS. And this is extremely expensive for us because each time we want to modify something, we need to synchronize with a lot of teams. Uh, we need to ask on various mailing lists. Uh, is anyone is using that? Is anyone using this log? Can we remove it? Can we move it? And that's extremely expensive, and we need to find a way to ease that for us. Also, we want to switch the five formats easily because we need to optimize now. And the last thing is that we need to separate concern between people that are doing the business logic of Hadoop jobs and the people that are maintaining the formats and the files. This is an infrastructure work, and on the other side, there is the business, people that are responsible for building the business logic. And they should not care about the format of the data and the quotas or the path, because they don't care. They want to build new algorithm, they want to test new things, and they should not care about how the data is stored on the hard drive. The biggest challenge doing that is that our production clusters are pretty big, and there is no possibility to say, OK, we will build something new, something better. So we will buy a new cluster, and once we are ready, we will migrate the data on the new cluster. This is not possible, because we just can't buy 2,000 machines for one project. So the biggest challenge doing that is that refactoring all this ecosystem while the, the production system is running all the time. And that's the reason why we built the data discovery framework. So what is data discovery? Um, data discovery is a framework that we build uh, in the reverse team. So the main goal is to uh, separate the storage layer from the usage. So people should be able to write their business logic and uh, create their jobs easily without having to uh, take care of the, whether the data are stored in JSON or Protobuf or Swift or whatever. And uh, this way we will be able to to switch from uh, on the SRE perspective to switch to a more efficient format to be able to reduce the cost of uh, disk and the cost of serialization, the serialization time uh, easily in a transparent manner. And uh, another thing that uh, we want to uh, to move uh, data from uh, one path to another for quota issues uh, because it's difficult to maintain quotas on Hadoop. And uh, currently, we uh, are adjusting quotas uh, like uh, every week uh, because uh, the use uh, is always increasing. And uh, we cannot move data because the paths are coded, as Francois said before. So this is a landscape of uh, what we are using currently in, uh, around Hadoop. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, we are using a lot of uh, frameworks, and uh, we have the building blocks of those frameworks. And what we did is uh, we 
put a lot of this information, uh, the schema of uh, the logs and some metadata as the base of data discovery. And uh, we'll, uh, I will uh, present you uh, in a few moments. And then uh, we moved to, uh, we implemented some wrapper on the Hadoop core uh, implementation and then just a few classes uh, for having the support in the frameworks. So first, uh, we wanted to have schemas. So I know that uh, nowadays it's possible to define schemas for JSON data, but it's not built in the, the format. So we decided to use a serialization format that supports schemas uh, at the core. So uh, that's uh, it's not a validation part, it's uh, at the, the emission. Uh, that we can validate the data and that's uh, validation after when we consume the data. So there are many alternatives for, uh, to achieve that. Uh, we have Avro, Thrift and Protobuf. Uh, we decided to use Protobuf because uh, it seems to us that it was easier to use, uh, um, contrary to Avro or Thrift that has a dependency on the deployment cycle for Avro or uh, deployment of uh, binary library for Thrift. And uh, there is a lot of tooling that is a development uh, with protocol buffer. Obviously, there are more and more alternatives uh, nowadays uh, on the schema serialization parts, uh, like Cap and Proto or other formats. But uh, those formats are not uh, really production ready. So protocol buffer was a good match. So this is an example of uh, what a protocol schema look like. So you have the name of uh, the schema, and then you have a definition of the field, and all fields are indexed by a number, a distinct number, and uh, you have built-in types like string, and you can reference some uh, external types that you define somewhere else, like origin, partition, and control message. So it's really simple uh, definition of, uh, of the structure of the, your message. And the advantage of protobuf is that it will get compiled in uh, every language uh, that we are using at Crypto, uh, that is uh, C Sharp, Java, and uh, Python. And they support many more languages, but at Crypto we only use uh, those three. Um, one uh, tiny wall that we hit when uh, we started using protobuf is a nullability issue. So in JSON, uh, there is the implicit nullability. So for example, booleans have not only two states, true and false, but they are of uh, the a third state as well, which is null. And um, a lot of stuff has been built uh, at Crypto using this uh, assumption. And for example, machine learning, uh, when you add a field to uh, a schema, uh, previously when uh, we were using JSON, as the data was not present, so the data was ignored. And uh, as soon as the data start, uh, started to get emitted, it was uh, put in the machine learning and it was working well. But with Protobuf, as there is no null by default, uh, we face the issue that the if we add a field, then the machine learning will start learning with the field. And uh, as there is no null, all previous data, we have the default value. So for example, Boolean, the default value is false. So that means that for all historical data, it will learn on false data. So the learning will be wrong. And uh, so we decided to create some plugin and uh, we found a way to uh, kind of emulate the nullability uh, feature in Protobuf. If you are interested, there is a, um, a long, uh, long discussion on this GitHub issue. Uh, feel free to share. So um, now that we have the schema, we can put some options. It's a really cool feature of uh, Protobuf. You can embed some option in your schema. So these are not the fields of uh, your message, but they are metadata for the message. So we define some uh, configuration, the sampling percent, the, is, the production, is this uh, 
uh, topic is sent by Kafka, and uh, which is the Kafka topic uh, for this, uh, this particular message. And the cool thing is that those options are portable messages as well. So they are accessible as code, and they are compiled uh, in classes as well. So all this information are accessible as code at runtime, at compile time. So you can automate a lot of stuff. You can uh, validate a lot of data. You can validate your configuration uh, at the creation of the configuration. So it's really nice. So now that we have the base of, uh, of our system, uh, let's move to Data Disco, uh, Data Discovery uh, core abstraction, that is uh, data sets. Uh, I don't know if everybody sees that in the, uh, at the back. So uh, data sets is, uh, is a way to abstract around uh, one business log. So a data set has an ID. Uh, so, for example, we had banner view, so the ID will be banner view, and the dataset can have multiple formats. And uh, format is just an indirection on the physical path and HDFS, and uh, an indirection on the file format used for the storage. So, currently uh, at Crypto, we have only uh, JSON Pay and uh, Protoref Parquet. But uh, the idea is that in the future, if you want to switch to uh, another format, we'll be able to add uh, a third one, and uh, then it will be transparent for uh, every user. And uh, we have a flag to set uh, if uh, there is two alternative formats uh, to decide which one to choose. And uh, last thing on this slide is the partition scheme. Uh, one good th thing to notice is that uh, all the data at Criteo on HDFS are partitioned by time. Uh, so we have uh, the default partition scheme is a day and hour. So that means that we have uh, the single bucket of data on HDFS is the hour. So that uh, we can switch uh, easily. So people, when they write Hadoop job, they consume on the hour basis. And uh, we can switch formats uh, at uh, any particular hour. So this is an example of the definition of the data set for banner view, for example. So we have the partition scheme. So uh, yeah, there is a platform already as well. So it includes a platform to separate data even more uh, by continent. And then we have the two formats, the legacy format and the new format. So in the first time, we uh, set the, first, uh, the legacy format as a preferred one. And after uh, some time of double run, we can switch to uh, the new format. And if there is only one format available for a given partition, it will take this format, uh, obviously. So. Uh, let me repeat that. Uh, the uh, really strong thing here is that all this information are accessible as code at compile time, at runtime. So you can build a lot of uh, automation programs around that. And uh, we'll see uh, this in a moment. And uh, all this information are in a single repository, in single Git repository. So there is only one single source of truth for those information. And no, uh, not anymore the hard-coded paths everywhere on uh, whole Hadoop jobs. So now that we defined the, the base of data discovery, we can, put on the, we can uh, move on the Hadoop core uh, level. So first, the file system. So no, we did not re-implement uh, another distributed file system. We are still using HDFS. What we did is just put a tiny layer on top of HDFS that will use this uh, compile time information about uh, the data set. And uh, we'll do the indirection from the logical path of the data set to the physical path on HDFS. So it's really a, a tiny layer uh, that will do the indirection. And uh, as you can see, you have the preferred format JSON for those two days, and then uh, we double log to uh, using both formats, and then we switch format like that, and then we decommission the old format. So this way, 
historical data will uh, stay as JSON, and new data will uh, be in Parquet, and it will be transparent for the user to consume data. They uh, don't care, they won't care, and it will work. It will uh, continue to work. So uh, an example, uh, currently the data uh, are stored on under those directory, and uh, it's a bit complicated. We want to uh, uh, we want the user to avoid having to put this uh, pass under uh, their jobs. What they want is only to consume bid requests. So what we design is a data disco file system with a data disco scheme. So now they can use data disco scheme like that. It will list uh, the contents of uh, directory of uh, both schemas or uh, one or the other. And uh, here they are only um, interested in the bid request, so they will consume the dataset bid request. So now that we have a file system that can dynamically point to one format or the other, the idea is to uh, work on the input format, output format, and output committers. So that uh, the input format can dynamically choose uh, which implementation depending on uh, whether it's JSON or protobuf data and HDFS transparently to the user. And uh, the same for output committer. When you are writing data, it can write uh, JSON data or protobuf data and uh, move uh, it to the correct directory of your data sets in the, at the end of the job. Another key uh, key things here is the interface log record. So uh, here uh, we uh, got back the JSON format, the protobuf format, and uh, if you want to add uh, another format in the future, you, we have uh, another method uh, get uh, future format. Uh, and uh, currently we have transcoder from JSON to protobuf and from protobuf to JSON. So independently of the, the input formats, it's the job that will decide uh, which format they will consume. So. We have a lot of legacy jobs that we won't rewrite uh, anytime soon that uh, expect uh, JSON data as input. So they will only put uh, data disco uh, uh, requirements as we will see uh, at the end of the presentation. And they will uh, use a get JSON under log record so that uh, they will be able to consume JSON data. And uh, for existing JSON data, it will be transparent. For protobuf data, they will use a transcription from uh, protobuf to JSON. And if they require more performance, uh, they can move to protobuf. So now that we have the core uh, implementation, uh, core wrapper of uh, all uh, Hadoop uh, core library, it's really simple to uh, develop a class for every framework. So we uh, develop a CRD to be able to, to read and write data with Hive, a cascading scheme for cascading, a scalding type log, and a Spark ID. It's really, really a small line of code, uh, like a few, a few tens of lines of code. It's really easy. And, um, so for Hive, uh, I don't know for you, but uh, if you maintain external table, it's really painful to maintain uh, schema changes uh, because you have to recreate partition with the new schemas. Here, uh, one table is bound to a data disco data set. And uh, as the schema is available as code, all the column are discovered uh, dynamically using the dataset information. So I'm not sure it's, if it's readable, but uh, here I'm creating a table bid request. I'm putting uh, data disco 30, data disco input format, uh, the dynamic location using only the dataset, and that's it. I don't have to put any other information. Everything is done dynamically by data disco. Instruments, instruments, instruments. You have to put metrics everywhere. We are moving from one format to another format. 
we want to measure if it's worth it and uh, what are the results. You want to uh, measure deserialization time, serialization time, transcoding time, and uh, disk usage in, in outputs. So um, the idea is that uh, we did uh, some measurements. Uh, we are really good in disk usage because uh, we are using half of the disk usage that was required from JSON uh, uh, before. And uh, the only problem is that uh, currently it uh, takes a bit more time to serialize data on HDFS. We are working on that to improve the situation. But uh, know that there is uh, only one single input format, one single output format. We can share knowledge across the R&D and uh, we can uh, improve the code base uh, of all the R&D. Concerning the deployments, uh, know that the um, schemas are available as a single artifact uh, built from a protobuf schema. We want to deploy uh, schema changes automatically. So the idea is that uh, when user wants to add a field to a schema, he push a uh, git review, we merge it, and then uh, we want all the downstream phase uh, test build package and deployment to be automated. We do not want to have uh, any manual step to do uh, with uh, schemas. We want all to be automated. And uh, we do not want to have to redeploy all the uh, other uh, Hadoop jobs. Because um, now that schemas are generated classes, uh, we cannot embed the schema directly in the Uber jar of a uh, client application. So we had to find a way to uh, deploy it dynamically without breaking uh, client uh, jobs. So for this reason, we use the Hadoop distributed cache. It's a way to, uh, to put a file in the class path uh, of the mapper and reducer at runtime. So how we do it, we deploy the new version of the schema, of the jar of the schema on HDFS and uh, we configure insa uh, inside data disco framework to um, go fetch the last version of the schema uh, in the configuration of the job. So this is an example of uh, how to develop a Halep job using data disco. So you define the configuration. Then the second line uh, is the only line required to set up the input. So what interests us is the uh, data set and the partition. That means that I will consume these data sets uh, for this period of time. And then I want to write uh, this data set in the output. Uh, and then it's my business logic. So it's really easy to uh, set up the input and output of uh, the job. And all this information are coming from the schema, so it's decorated from the uh, client job, and uh, it's really easier to maintain. For Spark, it's even easier. Uh, we added some helper method to consume for, from a data set like that and uh, write the data set. So data disco is really easy, and it's a really small change for existing jobs. So uh, it's really uh, fast to um, the migration to data disco is really fast, and uh, so that as soon as everybody yeah, is using data disco at Crito, we can switch uh, transparently from uh, one file format to another. And now I will let Francois talk about the takeaways. So. Um we learned a lot of things uh, during this project, and we had to do uh, a lot of archaeology over the past project and what was going wrong uh, in some past project. And from that, we kind of uh, inferred uh, a few requirements for a free to proof and maintainable big data environment. This is a joke. But uh, <laughs> we deduced a few rules that are uh, finding really useful and we, that we tried to apply while doing this project. The first one is 
uh, using contracts, uh, namely schemas, um, we found out that using schemas and using contracts on the data is somewhat the equivalent of having SLAs for services. And that's a way to agree with the, your client on what would be the content of your data. And I think that's, that's one of the key things that uh, helped us achieve this uh, project. The second thing is that making things discover discoverable. Um, because when there are a lot of people involved, a lot of teams, a lot of jobs, uh, people need to have a way to find out the data they are looking for easily. Because if not, there will be a lot of synchronization between people, between teams. Uh, there will be duplicated code. People will tend to work on the same things. And the key to avoid that is to allow people, enable people to find out information on their own. The third thing is making thing, things observable. Because as soon as you can't understand what is going on on your 2000s machines cluster, uh, you're pretty much lost. Because after that, there is no way to repair that. And inferring this data graph that is missing is extremely expensive. Because you have to, to pass gigabytes of logs that are produced every day you to try to understand what what's going on. And at Credeo, for example, we have some production jobs that are running, but we don't know if they are running. But we are, we are uh, seeing that they are running in production as soon as they are not running. Because sometimes there are some jobs that are running, that are running fine, and nobody noticed. And as soon as they are break, broken, uh, we noticed that there is one job that is useful for production reasons that, is, that was running before. The, the fourth thing is instrumentation. We realize that when you are changing an existing system, this, pr this is true for other things than this specific case, but you need to instrument before and you need to, to envision the way to instrument your framework because if you want to switch format, if you want to switch serialization format, file format, access layer, you need to have a way to evaluate before if you will be more efficient after than before. And what will be the characteristic of your, of your new format? Another thing is you need to have a way to compare the performances of different, of jobs that are using different frameworks. This is really convenient to be able to compare a Spark job and a Hadoop job in a way that provide you in, in a way that provide you a way to know if the first one is more efficient than the second one, and that's really important. And the last one is that abstracting the data is really useful because. The framework you are using, the format you are using, you will you will want to change at some point because it's not convenient anymore for your use case, and it's com is not convenient anymore for the usage you have of the data or the new framework you are using. And if you don't have any abstraction, you will tend to develop a lot of things on top of a specific framework. And at the time you will need to change, it will be really expensive to do so. And if you have some abstraction to avoid that you will be able to refactor without having to break all the things. That's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Hi, really nice job. Uh, just a question. In order to keep track of people using your data, uh, which who is using your data? Basically, you're interested in or people on changes on a GitHub repository of schema. I mean, if somebody changed the schema of your of uh, some data set, so everybody will get 
informed about it. How do you keep track of who is using your? It was not very clear this part, at least for me. <laughs> uh, so the question is, uh, who is you? How to keep track of who is using the uh, specific data set? Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are. So the thing is that. We are providing the data set framework, but we are also providing the way to use data sets. And we are providing an instrumentation that allows to uh, job to emit some kind of matrix uh, that contains the data sets and uh, the computing unit that is consuming or producing this data set. And uh, the idea is that we are using build from source at Criteo, so that every change is uh, compiled again all the neighbor's project. So if somebody removes a field that is used elsewhere, in JSON it's uh, impossible to track because there is no uh, actual classes, there is no statical comp compilation about the field. But uh, as soon as we will end the migration to Protobuf, People will use method creating, uh, created by the generated by uh, the Proto C compiler. So if somebody was using your field, you will use a method generated, and if you remove the field, it will break the compilation. So we'll be able to track uh, who is using what uh, and when. Uh, there is a question. Well, many thanks for, for, for sharing this with us. I know it's a hard job uh, because um, turning uh, hard data in more manageable things is quite challenging. So my question uh, was, um, I was wondering how about uh, flexibility and uh, agility for teams? Uh, for instance, if they want to, to log a new kind of uh, system, uh, they have to ask you uh, to build a new protobuf scheme and compile and then ship a new version or uh, they can uh, just uh, inject a new uh, new data structure in in protobuf existing protobuf uh, uh, versions so um we have a unique uh, git repository at Credeo that stores all schemas for all the business logs and what we do is that uh, we are using code reviews, and we have documentation that specify if you want to create a new business log, then you have to specify format and a few options that, that we described in the log. And we are reviewing the code, because it's code. And when we put uh, plus two and we validate the change, it's merged, and then it's available as code. So before to uh, emit new logs, they have to uh, specify the structure. Yeah. Build them, and after they can log. Uh, yeah. Okay. And okay, there is no impact to uh, business uh, teams uh, because it's a new step, you know. Actually, there is there are a few steps before the code. They need they still need to specify what will be the um, capacity planning because. Uh, we have to uh, we have to know what would be the size, the number of messages per yeah. second, this kind of thing before, because uh, uh, we are also maintaining the Kafka infrastructure that will contain the message. So we need to uh, to evaluate that before. Okay, thanks. And the, the idea is that, uh, as in the SQL world, when you want to create a table, you have to provide a schema. It should be the same for uh, any data flow, actually. So if you have the schema, you will know exactly what goes in the pipes that you are maintaining. And this gets a lot easier when uh, you are in this case. Uh, we have more than 500 uh, engineers in the R&D uh, currently at Critter. It's hard to synchronize uh, each day uh, with everybody. and. Uh, we are decentralized because we have a main office in Paris here, but we have offices in the uh, Bay Area. Mm. So with a nine hour delay, uh, automating a lot of stuff, uh, automating the code review stuff, uh, pipeline and documentation helps a lot. And having some contracts that define the way teams interact with each other really helps a lot. And so today is a new quality uh, metric for you, so each new project have to uh, 
or, or how to say conform to this kind of uh, system you you put in place uh, to the schema yeah. spe specification yes um, there is another thing that was not described here but is really useful for this kind of things that uh, we have, uh, as the schemas are code, and uh, we instrumented the parser to produce dynamically uh, documentation to the users. And we have some pre-submit uh, while doing reviews to check that people document each field to specify what is used for. And these parser generate documentation on the, on the log message to say, this field is, use, is used for that, uh, but also parsing the metadata that are contained so that the documentation also contain this message is stored in this IF table in, in Amsterdam, for example, or in Paris cluster. And that's really useful for people who are trying to bootstrap new, new business logs. And uh, yes, uh, one last comment is uh, we try to make a lot of implicit uh, configuration contracts uh, explicit because there was some implicit uh, configuration about the location of uh, this log or this log. There was an implicit uh, definition of the schema. So now it's explicit and uh, people can read it, people can uh, look at it and it's uh, easier to create new jobs knowing that uh, what you are building on. Other questions? No? Yeah. Uh, on, do we have time? Okay. Just a quick question. Uh, you said data will stay forever, but in fact, uh, also the data schema don't stay forever. I mean, data uh, schema are evolving. Or if you are upward compatible or backward compatible, that's not an issue. But sometimes you have to make a decision and change the data, uh, the data structure to uh, won't be compatible with previous version or whatever. So uh, I haven't seen anything about versioning in the definition of your schema. How, you, how do you handle that? Do you mean that in this case it will be a completely different uh, data set or how do you handle, handle that? So the idea is that with uh, Protobuf 3, uh, they decided to put, uh, uh, I will show you the schema. Uh, so the idea is, is with Protobuf 3, all fields are optional. So that is, uh, you can remove one field and uh, it will continue to work. You can add one field, it will continue to work. So with that in mind, it's re um, you will be able to continue uh, consuming data and uh, they will, it will not break. If you are, um, for example, uh, if we want to remove some field, let's say impression ID, and uh, we have to make sure that first nobody is using this field, and then uh, we can transparently remove the field, and if we continue to work, we will be able to read uh, existing data without this field. And uh, it's uh, a feature of... That's the easy part. I mean, that's a port compatible. I mean, for instance, when you have a field which change type, because before there was an integer, and suddenly uh, now you want to be more precise in, in the major, or you know more in integer, I guess it, it, it transforms to a float. So uh, you can handle by having two fields, the in field and the float field, or you can say, no, it's a new field, but the, the, the data type changed. Or you can have a field which was before one single value, now is a, is a list of value, or you see what... Uh, yeah, so the key thing here is that uh, we want to be able to continue uh, reading legacy data and new data with any schema, that is the uh, legacy schema and the new schema. So for this reason, if we want to change the type of one field, we will create another field and deprecate the previous one. And uh, it's a choice we, we did uh, when we started centralizing all schemas. Uh, it's a limitation, but uh, with this in mind, uh, we won't have any runtime issues uh, consuming any data. Uh, there was another. Another question. Hello. I'm really impressed by your work. Thank you. Um, especially the simplicity of it. Uh, 
And would it be uh, made available um, open sourced, or will it be merged into Hadoop? Actually, uh, we would like to, but the problem of doing that is that it's um, there are a lot of um, uh, things that are pretty specific to our infrastructure. So that would be possible, and we definitely want to do that at some point. But uh, currently, we need to uh, just uh, uh, create a border between what is uh, Creo specific and what is not. And it requires uh, to use, it's pretty cool to put above. Uh, the concept it should not be, but uh, wh like it is done currently, it's pretty uh, close to put above implementation and so on. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the contribution we are we are trying to contribute to Protobuf because we had the uh, multiple issue with Protobuf with um, Protobuf three new labels. We are trying to we are discussing with the Protobuf maintainer to try to integrate that with in the official Protobuf uh, code. And uh, we are using Protobuf 3, and uh, Hadoop currently is still using Protobuf 2, so we are using some uh, build uh, tricks to mix both versions at one time. And uh, so currently, I don't think it will be easier to easy to put it as open source as is, but uh, we keep in mind that uh, people are interested in projects like that. Thank you. <laughs>